Lovely, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for staying for the Marine session. Woohoo! Um, I want to talk to you this afternoon a little bit about transformative moments. We've all had them. They're incredibly important. They're the things that actually create a dog leg in our life. And sometimes we were chugging along in one direction, and the next thing you know, you've done a dog leg and you're doing something absolutely different. In fact, Jane Goodall last night was talking to us about how, as four and a four and a half year old child, she watched a chicken lay an egg. And that, for her, set her on the path of science wildlife conservation, and more. And she had a very supportive mother, actually. It was a great story because she had been missing, waiting for this chicken to lay an egg for four and a half hours. And her mother was very worried about her, but did not castigate her and listened to that story with great support. And look where that got Jane Goodall. I have to say, my mother's done very much the same thing for me. So. This is one of the transformative moments that I have now on a regular basis. The first time I had this was in 1990, swimming with over 50 gray reef sharks in, in Sinai Peninsula. This happens to be in Roatan, Honduras. But every single time I get to swim with the top predators in the sea, it really shifts something inside me, and I connect with nature. And this is something that you see with a lot of people, the yearning to connect with nature. I love this meme because it says everything that you need to know about the PR with sharks. Unfortunately, sharks, as you know, have really bad PR and uh, public relations. And so we really need to do a lot to reverse that. And the reason we need to do that is because we are seeing massive declines in shark populations. I'm just showing you the head of an endangered scalloped hammerhead, which is one of the most fish sharks out there, and just one of the infographics that's been generated by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And the two takeaways here are that the vulnerable, endangered, and critical categories for these animals count for 24% of the assessed species of sharks and rays, which right now are about 1,038 species. What does this mean? This means that 24% of these species are now vulnerable to extinction or more. And what's even worse is that that entire gray part of the pie, 47%, we don't even have enough data to determine what's going on with those species. So we have a lot of work to do. We have at least 3.7 million fishing vessels in the world. So next time you eat seafood, think about how much fishing effort there is going on. And one of the reasons I mention this is because why are we having such declines in, in shark populations? Why are they in such critically bad state? Because a lot of these animals, for those who may not know, don't reach sexual maturity, the larger ones, until they're at least 10, 15 years old. With a whale shark, 25 or 30. With a Greenland shark, 150 years old. And many of them have a gestation period for at least a year, if not two years with some species, and then they have a reproductive pause. So they cannot keep up with the fishing effort that you're seeing. I show this large, large mothership with some of the side ships just to say that this is one way that fish and sharks in particular are being fished, and they are being fished very heavily. So a lot of folks think that the major demand for shark is actually due to the fin trade in Asia. It is a key demand. But the biggest threat to sharks is just from fishing, overfishing. And that overfishing takes many forms. You see a whale shark there with the basket of tuna. So when you eat tuna, there's all kinds of bycatch that's coming with it. And it might include manta rays or whale sharks even. You see the fins from the whale shark there, too. They are all part of the fin trade, but it's not for food. It's usually as a status symbol and a banner for restaurants. A set of fins can reach $15,000 in cost. And manta rays? Manta rays now are being sought after for their gill rakers, so what they manage to breathe through 
those are being taken from their bodies and dried and used as a tonic in Chinese traditional medicine. But it, it's never been proven that they actually work. But I really want to focus on the small-scale fisheries. They, con they constitute the majority of fisheries in the world, and these are the traditional fishers that we mainly work with. We don't have the scope and breadth to do everything at my organization, Mar Alliance. We don't have the scope and breadth to work with the big, the big boats, all species of sharks and rays, which now number over 1,250 species. But we can, we can work in some key areas where we can have a key impact, mainly with small-scale traditional fishers who are really trying to survive either sustenance or small-scale commercial fisheries. And they do have an impact, a very, very large impact, especially on coastal sharks. The majority of all those species that I mentioned are actually coastal in nature. 50% of them are coastal in nature. So that is really where we're working, is on the interface of that coastal area, shallow coastal seas, and mainly in coral reef coastal communities. We're discovering more and more that people are pulling in species that they never expected to pull in, such as stingrays. A lot of people have seen them in kind of tourism sites, etc. but these form the basis of fisheries in countless countries, especially in Central America where I work. El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, even Belize, uh, Mexico, and more. And some of the some of the products that are derived from the sharks and the rays are not only for consumption in the communities themselves, but they actually go to meet another form of demand that a lot of people may not be aware of, and that is um, religion. So during the Catholic Lenten season, people really want to eat fish. They're not allowed to eat red meat. They feel like they are doing better duty in their Catholicism, and therefore they will eat uh, fish. What is the fish with the largest fillet? Usually shark or ray. So we've seen that, unfortunately, religion has taken a big impact or has made a big impact on sharks and rays as well. And <clears throat> I wanted to bring all of this to your attention because a lot of folks think that the fin trade is really one of the drivers for the decline in sharks. And I just want to bring home the fact that it's overfishing. Overfishing, overfishing, overfishing on all levels, at all scales, in all countries. And that there are other areas where sharks are being used, which a lot of people don't realize, like your fish and chips. Actually, they did some DNA barcoding of fish and chips, for example, in, in Britain and also in Australia, etc. And they found that a lot of fish and chips are actually made up of endangered species. But they've been kind of smuggled into the fish and chips under the batter and such. So little did we know that with our mushy peas, we are eating endangered species. Your pets. Our pets. I didn't know until recently, um, conducted by a colleague of mine, Mr. Cardenoso, that our pet foods also contain shark. They're not even labeled on the, pet food, lab on the um, food labels. And if you're thinking of trying to boost your joints, a lot of people go to chondroitin sulfate and other such products that are derived by sharks. And your lipsticks may be containing squalene, which come from the oil of, and of livers and sharks as well. So these are some new locations that we're seeing shark products being pulled from. So you think with all of this demand, these 3.7 fishing million fishing vessels, huge amount of seafood consumed. How do we make a difference for sharks? How do we do it? So one of the first things that we determined was that a lot of people don't even realize that they're eating shark. Those, that dried fish that I showed that is being required for Lenten season, people don't even know they're eating shark when they're eating that dried fish. So a lot of it is going out doing these public perception surveys, having focus group discussions across multiple countries, meeting with the public, 
raising awareness. That's really been a huge first step that we've done. And what comes back from that is knowledge about what people's perceptions are. How scared are they of sharks? How much do they want to support conservation more? And what we found was that the, I'd say half of all people surveyed, we had these perception surveys throughout Central America, half of them are still scared of sharks. In fact, a lot of people are quite terrified of them. I don't know why, I think they're quite cuddly myself. But they're almost all in favor of their conservation. And they've seen so much on TV now, they've seen the decline in these in these, uh, in these populations that they want to see something done. So, we took what they suggested to us and we started creating campaigns. And our first big campaign is in Honduras, which is the first shark sanctuary in all of Latin America. Unfortunately, most of the people didn't know it. So it was a created by a top-down approach, and what we're doing is we're underpinning it from the bottom again and trying to raise awareness so that we can meet them in the middle. Everything from malls and airports and everything, we're trying to inspire the wonder and awe that we've all had in transformative moments when we've actually been with sharks. Bye -bye. And we want to show that these animals are not the bloodthirsty killers that so many people still think that they are throughout the tropics. This is a tiger shark that we've named Kalema after a wonderful band in the eastern tropical Atlantic. Beautiful female swimming away there with her satellite tag on her fin. This allows us to determine where she is whenever she comes up to the surface and that satellite tag transmits her position. This shows um, a colleague of mine, Zeddy Simo, who is letting her go into the deep. And the reason I'm showing you Kalema is not only does she inspire under and wonder and awe, but she also helps to fill in the gaps and makes us understand that we need to work together regionally and globally for certain species. And so this is Kalema's path. So for example, she started, let me see if I can do this, oh, here we go. So she started up in Cape Verde, 10 islands off the coast of West Africa near Senegal. She didn't transmit for quite some time. She started transmitting near the Mid-Atlantic Trench, and then she had a really lovely route down towards Brazil, a few caipirinhas, probably met a really nice fella, then back again, had a second thought, maybe more caipirinhas over here. I mean, that's what I would do. Um, and then made her way steadily back up towards West Africa. We happen to know that this is an area, because we've been tracking a lot of the fishing activity, where you have a lot of long lining and per se netters. So either the battery on her transmitter died, or perhaps she got caught. But what she has given us is the first ever instance of transatlantic movement of a tiger shark and then back again, showing that we really must work together between the East and Western Atlantic for this particular species. So how, and so just to, to mention with that, we not only work at the community level, we are also trying to bring some of the data that we've got from this really cool science up to the policy level as well. And this is really important. So we take what we do in the communities, we train a lot of the fishers that we work with in these communities in science and research, and we help also build their voice so that they can be an active participant in decision making and also feed into policy making. Because traditional fishers in almost all tropical countries have an incredibly strong voice. But a lot of the time, they don't understand how science is done or why science is done. So we are trying to change that throughout countries like Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, Cape Verde, um, Micronesia. And we're also, through the work that we do with them, including them in the science and the research and the long-term monitoring of these species, they are having their own transformative moments. So they are going from guys who would normally kill these animals without a second thought to, oh my God, my mandate now is to keep them alive at all costs. I have to keep these alive. 
Zé Luis Montero before, for folks who've been here before, might know him. He used to be a shark fisher. Wouldn't think twice about dispatching a shark. But now he, does, he is the voice for shark conservation amongst fishers in many of Cabo Verde's islands, and even has the ear of the president now. So that's how you build those voices, you create those links, you facilitate and enable those links. And Choka, he's a new fisher on our team, he's amazing, and he now loves sharks. But just a love of sharks and a changing of attitude is not going to put food on your table. So the other thing that we try and do is we try and create economic alternatives with the fishers, either with them being part of our team or some of the work that we do in terms of monitoring, or we're looking at a whole range of other economic alternatives, seaweed growing and more. And it's very, very important that all of this gets spread horizontally. So I, once I've trained folks, I remove myself from the picture, and they take the lead. They're going to listen a lot more to folks in their own communities than they are to me. And this has been an incredibly wonderful way of galvanizing communities for the conservation, not just of sharks, but also we work with turtles and big fin fish. And this is really important, because what we're seeing across all the communities we're working in is a massive decline, not only in the number of predatory fish, so the sharks and rays, but also the big fin fish. So the tunas and the barracudas and the jacks and such, and we're left with really small, low uh, fish low on the food chain. And one of the key reasons is because a lot of people are using unsustainable fishing gears. So, for example, in Belize, we've formed a co coalition where we're now trying to move all fishers away from nets to declare what would be the first national ban on nets in an entire country. So we're looking forward to that, and it's looking very positive. And where we can, we move people over to other species. Very important. So keep them away from nets, keep them away from sharks, start eating Species like the invasive lionfish, turrets, volatans, delicious. If you see it in a restaurant, please order it, please eat it. Eat as many as you can. But don't get stung by them. It'll make you cry, or worse. Very important to this is also bringing in women and children, and especially young women. So we are looking to work more and more with not just fishermen, but fishermen's daughters because daddies love their daughters. And if the daughters say, but dad, why are you bringing home these species? You know they're endangered. We have potentially a greater opportunity to, to reduce threats to some of our endangered species that we're studying. And not only that, we're really trying to raise the capacities and level of schooling for a lot of the young women in the communities and the countries where we work in. This is Ana Batista. She's our uh, young research officer in Panama, working with one of the very few female fishers in one of the ports where we work. And I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit about how we also meet transformative moments or make transformative moments happen to the broader public. So you have those big displays in airports, et cetera, but that's not necessarily meeting the communities, or meeting folks in the communities. So what we've started doing is bringing VR to fishers, decision makers, and other folks in the communities, including leaders. And so in a partnership with Steve Mandel and Oceans360, as well as Rick Miskiv and 22 Degrees, we've had really great success so far. And uh, I just want to share with you, this is some of the VR filming that I did, some of you may have seen it outside. So we found that they're absolutely incredible. We can't take everybody out with us. Not everybody can be part of those hands-on transformative moments, but we found that VR is actually can accelerate those connections with nature. So we're, we're expanding that program readily across multiple countries where we work. 
And I just want to end with a little story because I know my time is up. Um, every person counts when we're talking about fishing, overfishing, species, and more. And uh, you wonder who this fellow might be. This is Mauricio White. He always laughs about his last name. Um, he is a taxi driver that I befriended in Panama City. And uh, of course, I chatted to him every time I'd go off to the airport about sharks, and he'd ask a lot of questions. And so on the last trip in the taxi coming here, he said, hey, I want to tell you, I caught some hammerheads. I said, you did? He said, yes. He took his hands off the wheel, which scared the bejesus out of me. And he showed me how big they were. They were about the size of the wheel, actually. And I nearly, I, I nearly keeled over. I was so excited because that meant that he had found a brand new shark nursery that we knew nothing about for endangered scalloped hammerheads in a part of Panama we had never guessed. And he said, when I said, well, what did you do with the hammerheads after you caught them? I'm, I, I don't castigate anybody. I'm just like, so what did you do? And he said, with a big smile, I let them go. And I was so impressed. And he said, I want to know how I can do more of this, how I can rope my fishing buddies in, um, because we're really excited that we found the babies and we want to keep the babies alive. And this is just to show you how incredibly cute they are. So I told you that they're cuddly, right? Yeah. So if you never thought that sharks were cuddly, Anyway, so it takes all of us, every single one of us on our team, that's what we're doing, trying to spread the love, get the message out, identify local talent, nurture that talent, and just move horizontally with this message. And that is one of the key ways that we're trying to reverse declines in sharks and rays in particular sites, in particular countries where we work. Thank you.